I'm um, going to get started. My name is Elaine Lin, and I'm the academic uh, advisor to the um, Global Health Certificate here at the University of Pittsburgh. We are so pleased that you could join us as part of our um, University Center for International Studies um, Career Toolkit Series. We began this about eight years ago. Um, and it was a way for students to learn about the wide um, variety of careers that are out there, because so many come into my office saying, I want to work for the United Nations or the State Department, or I'm pre-med. Um, and it's there's a whole lot out there. So um, it's a great way for our students to connect with, um, with experts. And, um, and those, um, I particularly like to um, bring back our alumni who once sat in my office and here they are now um, rising, if not um, professionals in the field of global health. Um, I encourage any of the students who can, um, at some point, I encourage them to when they ask questions to turn on their cameras because this is a networking as well and you might want to reach out to some of our speakers at some point um, and uh, follow up with an email or on LinkedIn, um, but that's totally up to you. Um, I just always encourage our students to do that. So today we have um, five uh, professionals who are working um, throughout the world. Um, and I am going to, uh, it's so wonderful to see these faces popping up. Um, anyway, we're going to, I'll start out throwing out some um, questions for our speakers. Um, and then uh, we'll open up for Q&A from um, our students that are participating. Um, I'm going to just quickly introduce the speakers, um, and, but I expect them to go into more detail. Um, we have Chris Hegedorn, is that correct? Is it a soft G or hard G? Hard G, Hegedorn. Hegedorn, yeah. okay. Hegedorn, nice who is the CEO of Hegdorn um, Global Consulting. He um, has served as um, sec secretary and now on the committee of World um, Food Security, um, affiliated with the United Nations. He's also a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh. We want you to go more into your academics as well as your professional um, um, credentialing as well. We have Evelyn um, Beghini, who is a clinical research coordinator at UC San Francisco, working on the project Healthy Children um, and Environment Study. Um, Evelyn uh, graduated with a Master's of Global Health and Equity, um, as well as a Master's in Global Health, um, both overseas um, institutions. Um, and she uh, was a 2020 graduate of the School of Nursing. We also have uh, Ruba Idris, who um, just um, um, celebrated her one year at Chemonix as a senior associate for Malaria Task Force Order. She graduated with a master's in um, health and International Development from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and she's a 2018 Pitt graduate. We have Niha Mehta, who I haven't seen for years, so wonderful to see you here. She graduated from Pitt with a Bachelor of Philosophy in International and Area Studies with our Global Studies program, um, and I believe it was about um, um, Traditional healthcare practices in India, right? Yes, I didn't look that up. I remembered it. 
Um, she also received her master's from the University of Pittsburgh and in the School of Public Health. And she has a, um, she works at the Center for D Disease Control. We also have Megan Swanson, who is, um, her mother is a friend of mine, and she, her mother was telling me about the great stuff she's doing at the um, uh, Center for Disease Control, and I'm glad she was able to participate. Megan also graduated with a master's in public health um, here at the University of Pittsburgh. So there might be others joining us, um, uh, but we're going to start off now and in we're going to go the way of how I introduced you. So I believe it was Chris and Evelyn, then Ruba, then Neha, and then Megan. And first off, could you tell us about your current position and what your day looks like? Okay, thank you. Elaine, can I call you Elaine? Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you and Honored to um, to be here and part of uh, in in this way of supporting University of Pittsburgh. I'm a um, a Gispia graduate, 1992. Studied public and international affairs after working in Washington for a bit, and um, yeah, I've I left Gispia with a presidential management internship in place to go work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Many of you probably recognize the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children. And so I think my connection here is that I deal with food security and nutrition issues, typically. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how and where, but after um, about a year and a half as a PMI, as a Presidential Management Internship, now called Presidential Management Fellows, that it was a 1970s program designed to bring public policy students into the federal government. So if you're not familiar with the PMF program, I highly recommend it. But um, I had a better offer. I had taken the foreign service exam as part of the Department of State, uh, also in my last semester at Pitt. And it takes a while. You first take a written exam, and then you take a uh, oral exam. It's an all-day battery of, of uh, group exercises. And then if you're selected, it takes a while for a security check and background check to be done. Uh, and then you wait to get on a list. But I waited and was brought into the State Department where I worked for about 27 years um, all around the world. So in China, in South Africa, in uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Iraq. Um, and then I wound up working in Paris, uh, well, Rome first on food security, dealing with the UN agencies, and then uh, later in Paris, where I was the US representative to UNESCO. So I've had a very varied uh, career. It wasn't always food and agriculture, wasn't always nutrition. In fact, I was dealing with missile negotiations with China, economic development in South Africa. So if you are interested in a diplomatic career, there are ways to do that and be focused on health, medicine, nutrition. Um, happy to, to answer any questions about that. But when I retired, I left Paris and the U.S. mission to UNESCO in 2018, left the State Department, still young enough to start another career, fortunately. Um, and so I went to work with the FAO, that's the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And what I was hired to do was to run the secretariat of something called the Committee on World Food Security, as you mentioned. That's a, a committee that brings in countries together with UN agencies, civil society, the WHO, for example, is heavily involved on the nutrition side. And what the committee does is develop recommendations and guidance for governments and communities to address certain issues associated with food and hunger. And so it's a, um, a committee with 139 member countries. It's based in Rome. It meets throughout the year. And we deal with everything from food systems reform to gender equality. Um, so I did that for about four years. Moved to Paris with my now wife, who's a teacher, um, who's resuming her teaching career back in Paris. And on top of some consulting projects that I do, 
I'm also teaching at Sciences Po, which is why I left that in the in the rename box. So that's a public policy university in Paris that um, where I teach the politics of global food security. So usually one course per semester, about 25 graduate students, and we go go through all the all the fun and messy politics associated with food, agriculture, and nutrition. So um, let me leave it there. Um, I also consult with Chatham House in London projects related to food systems, uh, for which nutrition obviously is a massive part of that. And um, and uh, I'm based in Paris. So I try whatever leftover time I have, I try to enjoy France and, and Paris. Over. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I have a lot of questions to follow up, particularly what's going on in mm -hmm. the world right now. I just heard about the pending starvation of Palestinians and what does that mean for organizations like yours? But we'll go back. We'll go up to that. Evelyn. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Evelyn. As Elaine said, Elaine, it's great to see you. Um, I remember sitting in your office and um, it was when the global health certificate, I think, first started. And so we were trying to, and I had like two years left or something in the nursing program, which is already packed. So we were trying as best we could to, to fit everything in. Um, so I'm just super happy to, to be here. Um, yeah, so I can just give a brief background about what um, I've done since graduating Pitt and then go into what um, my, current, my current day looks like. So I graduated um, from the School of Nursing in 2020. Um, it was when things were shutting down um, from the pandemic. So we went our nursing class, um, I was finishing my transitions uh, clinical on a general pediatrics unit. And we went on spring break and never went back. <laughs> so things were um, a bit chaotic for a new nursing student graduate. Um, a lot of people were applying for residency programs and things, and, and a lot of those had closed. And I was really fortunate to have received the uh, Fulbright um, scholarship to be able to do a master's in global health in the Netherlands. So um, also a hectic time to travel. Most Americans were banned from Europe at the time, um, but because I was a student, I was able to go. So, um, and I found out a week before I was, like I left that I was basically able to go. So a hectic time, um, but I really enjoyed my experience in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so studied, did a master's of global health there. And my thesis was on community gardens in New York City. Um, and they're a qualitative research project and how people interpreted how they impacted um, their health and well-being during, during the pandemic. And that was really a great experience for me because I also learned, you know, we, we talk about global health and it's so important focusing on these equity issues around, you know, around the world, thinking about like WIC, for example, like food security in the U.S. and community gardens in the U.S. Um, there's so much that can be done here as well. And then um, during that time, so I focused more on environmental health um, in the master's and then was fortunate to receive a scholarship to study at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda for a year. Um, so I did a master's in, uh, what is it? Master's in global health delivery there. So it's a bit more focused on implementation. And um, so my thesis per the, the university, they asked, uh, my research partner tonight to do um, to ask academics about how One Health, which is like human, animal, and environmental health, um, kind of like planetary health or climate change and health, are impact are um, in sub-Saharan African medical curricula. So we interviewed um, and asked uh, different academics and and physicians and in, in sub-Saharan Africa to complete a survey. Um, and now I've since moved um, to the University of California, San Francisco where um, I'm still in the current the current role. I'm technically a graduate student assistant now, um, but it's still the same job. Um, but I started my PhD program in nursing um, at UCSF. So continuing work, uh, we work with child care centers um, to detect and try to reduce pesticide exposures um, that children are exposed to. So, um, which brings me into my daily life, which changes every day. Obviously, most people know as students, you know, and working, you're constantly kind of running around. Um, I was actually supposed to take this meeting from uh, like on site at a child care center today, but as everyone does, I slept through my alarm this morning. 
and it's it's 9 a.m. here in um in San Francisco. So I will go after this. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun. I enjoy being in a PhD program. There's a lot of opportunities um, and like a fellowship I'm doing. So uh, every day changes whether I'm in class or out in the field um, working. So happy to answer you know any additional questions. Ripa, you're on the spot. Hi, everyone. Hi, Elaine. Nice to see you again. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ripa. I graduated from Pitt in 2018, which was like such a long time ago. Um, when I was at Pitt, I was in the School of General Studies, so I did um, my bachelor's in health services, but I also had uh, like various certificates, um, global studies, African studies, etc., um, while I was at Pitt, I did a lot of uh, study abroad um, and internships, most of them being in on the African continent. After I graduated, I kind of continued with that. I took, I would say, about a gap here where I didn't, the work that I did was not related to my actual work that I do now. Um, and I worked mostly in, uh, I worked at UPMC and then I worked for a startup. Um, for a few months, and then I became a uh, Princeton Africa fellow. So I worked in Lesotho for what was supposed to be a year had COVID not come. Um, so I worked for about seven months in Lesotho um, at an HIV clinic, um, uh, the Baylor uh, Children's Foundation, uh, based in Lesotho. And they have other other um, other uh, NGOs throughout the continent of Africa. Um, afterwards, again, I think COVID kind of messed things up a little bit, but, um, afterwards I, uh, was working again for Princeton in Africa. So I was able to finish that out, um, while I was ab abroad, I came back to the United States, um, and I was able to finish that out. And then I worked for Princeton in Africa, um, while waiting to get my master's, I had to defer my master's for a year. So then I um, started my master's program at LSE um, that September of uh, 2021 um, and graduated 2022, December. And I studied health and uh, international development. And now I work at Comonix as a um, senior associate for the uh, Malaria Task Order, which is part of a bigger project. It's um, the largest project that USAID has implemented. So Comonix is a um, government contractor. And so we're the primary contractor for this project, the Global Health um, Supply Chain Pro uh, Procurement Supply Management Project. Um, and so I manage a portfolio of six countries um, that don't have field offices. So I manage um, mostly the uh, procurement of commodities, of malaria commodities um, from start to finish. And then also the relationships with USAID and with uh, USAID headquarters here in Washington. USA in the countries and then also implementing partners. Um, so my day-to-day -day really is a lot of tracking, um, shipments, making everything, making sure everything gets there on time, um, but also uh, tracking funding, making sure that we're not uh, overspent and managing relationships with uh, internal teams, um, procurement team, finance team, um, and also external teams, um, like I mentioned with uh, USAID and other implementing partners as well. Um, so yeah, that's mostly my day-to-day. -day. Um, in terms of interest, I'm very focused on health and international development, specifically infectious diseases, and more specifically uh, malaria and neglected tropical diseases. I did my master's dissertation on uh, mass campaigns for uh, neglected tropical diseases, kind of comparing um, China's campaign to Uganda's campaign and why China's was was successful. What can be learned from that uh, for schistosomiasis? And uh, I think moving forward, that's kind of just been my my focus is really uh, malaria, neglected tropical disease, specifically on the on the African continent. I um, was lucky enough to study abroad, intern, and work in a few African countries. Um, I haven't been back. In like I think two years at this point, but uh, I'm looking, I'm hoping that whatever next position I have allows me to work on the work on the on the continent. Um, yeah, so that's that's me. 
อ่าเมฮะใช่ hi uh nice to see you again Elaine and nice to meet everyone else uh my name is Neha Mehta and I work for the CDC I work in the division of global HIV and TB uh, and I just moved to Atlanta about a year and a half ago so I'm enjoying uh not being in winter in Pittsburgh though I do dearly love Pittsburgh and would never speak ill of uh, my hometown um I'm from Pittsburgh so I grew up in Pittsburgh um my whole life and went to undergrad and grad school at Pitt. Um, and actually, I think they don't have it, but I went to governor's school at Pitt as well for international studies. I have like a very We have long, it. okay, We so I went to PGS Oh, we second. have it. You're going to be paid for a pit day of giving. <laughs> I'll make sure. <laughs> yeah, so I have like a long tie to Pitt and um, global studies and global health. And um I was very lucky after I graduated from my master's program, I got a fellowship program that unfortunately is discontinued now with the CDC called the Allen Rosenfield Global Health Fellowship. And um, it sent me to Mozambique to work out of the CDC office in Mozambique. And I meant to be there for one year, but seven years later, I joke that it took a global pandemic for me to come home because I kept on finding other reasons to stay in Mozambique. which is a co country on the coast of Africa where the waters are clear and the beers are cheap. So it was very easy to stay there um, for a few extra years unintended. But I, I more or less had the same job for the past over over 10 years now um, in, in that I work in global HIV. Um, so I spent seven years in the country office in Mozambique and now for the past almost four years, I've been back with uh, CDC headquarters. And the U.S. government uh, funds a lot of the world's HIV programming. So what we do at CDC headquarters is we help support our country offices because there's a CDC office in, I definitely should know this number, but like 40, 50 plus countries around the world. Um, and they're usually embedded either within the U.S. embassy or the Ministry of Health of that country, depending on how the program is working. So I support, um, I'm on a... monitoring and valuation and data, data analytics branch. Uh, and we do a variety of activities from making dashboards, working in Excel, building uh, HIV models. Um, so a few, like a variety of different things. And of course, uh, sometimes the most important part of any job is just like building and maintaining relations with a whole different diverse group of people, which I remember when I was in school and we had group projects where we had like 10 people working on one PowerPoint. I'm like, wow, that's so dumb. Like, why would we do it like this? But that's also half of my job is like 10 people working on one PowerPoint. So it ended up being very, uh, very helpful. Um, yeah, and my day to day. So our division is actually fully remote. So I'm at home in my office. Um, and uh, it, it's nice. We have everyone uh, works with so many people in different time zones and different countries. So the kind of the flexibility, like sometimes you're up at 5 a.m. and sometimes you have calls at 11 p.m. depending on what country you're working with. Um, and when I'm not at home, so I just came back from Angola a few weeks ago and a few weeks I'm about to go to South Sudan. So we definitely go out to the different countries that we support um, just to make sure that the HIV program is running as intended again it's like a you know u.s government funding so you, some of it is like fiscal responsibility to our taxpayers i sound i sound like such a like such a government worker when i say that um but also making sure that the programs are running and what we're doing is working the way we want it to happen and of course making sure that we're working like hand in hand with the ministries of health because at the end of the day it's their program and their country Um, and I don't think I've answered any of the questions that were asked, but um, hope, yeah, hope that was good for an intro and look forward to talking more. So thank you. Uh, Megan Swanson, you're you're up. Hi. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, Go ahead. so I began my professional or pre-professional career, I guess, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, where I got a biology degree uh, and then moved on to the Graduate School of Public Health, where I earned my master's degree in a degree that also doesn't exist anymore. It was called the Microbiology of Infectious Diseases, but it effectively means like the Epidemiology of Infectious Diseases. Um, and I took a maybe less traditional route into global health than other folks. I actually began working uh, in HIV domestically in the United States 
first for the state of Arizona, where I did a lot of different um, public health work around uh, epidemiology and surveillance of diseases, as well as program implementation uh, for people to provide health care for people with HIV as part of the Ryan White program, which is run by HRSA. Uh, and then I moved to New York State, where I also worked uh, in HIV domestically for the state. Uh, and then I moved on to CDC, where I began my career there in the, uh, it was called the Center for Global Health at the time, but now it's called the Global Health Center in the Division of Parasitic Diseases and Malaria, where I served as an epidemiologist uh, in parasitic diseases, specifically um, a tick-borne parasite called babesiosis. But we, in that uh, division and the branch that I was in, we provide both domestic and international uh, support uh, and public health services and epidemiology and surveillance for both domestic and international parasitic diseases. So those are both neglected tropical diseases, uh, many of them neglected tropical diseases, uh, both domestically and internationally, because we do have neglected tropical diseases in the United States. Um, and in that role, uh, I did a lot of work, uh, both in the uh, sort of like clinical end of things, though I'm not a clinician, uh, working with providers to help them understand uh, when their patient may be at risk for a disease, as well as working on surveillance outbreaks of uh, these sort of more unusual parasitic diseases that people wouldn't see very often, uh, as well as providing uh, more technical support around informatics and data science, which um, have become much more critical as time has gone on. Uh, around this time, of course, is COVID. So I did uh, quite a bit of work on the COVID response uh, and more applicable for this uh, work with the International Task Force uh, from the CDC, where we worked with uh, our own uh, colleagues overseas in embassies, just like Neha was saying, how we operate across the world. Uh, each of those offices also worked with their ministries of health, et cetera, around COVID, uh, no matter what their technical roles were. Uh, and then I moved over to DGHT, where I work as a colleague of Neha in the maternal and child health branch. She's in a different branch than I am. Um, but in that role, it's sort of similar. So I can just ditto to some of what she said. Uh, but we provide support for maternal and child health programs, as well as cervical cancer um, and some childhood tuberculosis work uh, across the world in countries, mostly sub-Saharan Africa. And that support can be both around program implementation and data science as well. Um, and so I've been doing that for around a year after switching over from parasitic diseases. But yeah, so that's um, my background. I'll hand it back over, I think I'm the last person. Thank you so much all for um, sharing this information with us, telling us what you do and basically how, how you got there. Um, I'm, I have uh, posted in the chat if students want to or others want to ask questions, uh, you can raise your hand virtually or just post the question um, in the in the chat line. I, I don't want to dominate this um, as I'm not of um, I'm just a, interested and curious what um, you folks are doing. But for our budding and rising students interested in global health, you might have some other questions. So we'd love for you to ask those as well. Um, so just you guys have thrown out a lot of um, uh, a lot of information. And one thing that I um, this kind of goes right into the narrow focus of things. But Neha, you said we build an HIV model. And I have no idea what something that like that means. And and what does what does building an HIV model what what is involved with that? Uh yeah. So uh I, I uh two two parts to it. One is that we work with the UN. UN needs has uh they lead kind of this large international project that goes across international agencies like our agencies within the US that work in the field of HIV and then local countries. And in this model, you enter in three or four different types of data. So you have data from surveys and through surveillance that's been collected in each of the countries. You have data from 
programs, like programmatic data, like how many people are on treatment according to your data that you're collecting of health facilities. And then we work um, through like some sentinel surveillance projects, like additional information um, along with the census data. And it's put into a model that's been developed for like 20 some years with um, like a separate group that works on building out the model. And then every year you go through and you update all the different inputs and you kind of like configure your model based on trends that you're seeing in HIV and knowledge that you have in country and keeping good track of what is the quality of the input of your data. So always say like garbage in, garbage out. Um, so you're kind of working through that and the model gets uh, refined every year as well. So I sit on this UNAIDS reference group that gets together a few times a year and goes through the literature that feed the assumptions into the model, as well as some of the technical aspects of like, how well is this model fitting what we are seeing in real time? Um, and then there's other like smaller modeling projects that we do, like that's a huge, that's like our big, big modeling project. There's other smaller things that countries work on. So with machine learning coming up and with some AI technologies, we run um, our country's like patient level data through different models that we fitted trying to predict outcomes for patients or like where what's the best location to put a health facility. And those we run a little bit more internally. Um, and it's fun because you get to design them and pick them and fit them and see, you know, sometimes we do models, they don't end up being very applicable or the results don't quite make sense, but it's nice to at least sit and think through those products. And from like a technical stance, the models that we do more internally, we tend to run them in R. Um, so that's like the big, I would say globally, the the program, because it's free and open source, like that's what we do most of our work. Um, and then again, that big model with UNAIDS is actually through a software that was designed specifically for, for HIV and other disease modeling. Um, we have a question. Uh, when people go into the global health fields, are they more likely to have degrees, uh, degrees aligned with health topics or global issue topics? So I guess, uh, Chris, I'm going to throw this out to you. I was going to say I'm probably the one with the least bit of a uh, global uh, global health career. My work has touched upon nutrition, of course, which is hugely uh, relevant and important, but um, I didn't choose to go into a global health field per se. It was um, actually the, the the first job I had with USDA. Um, and again, that's an agriculture social safety net program. Many of us know it, uh, if not the details, at least the name. And the, the idea there was, um, and still is, to provide pregnant and um, nursing women access to both medical care and uh, nutritional supplements. So they're eating properly, both for themselves and their, their, uh, their unyet born or uh, small children up to five years, I think is the limit. So um, again, maybe some, some of the others, uh, Evelyn or, or others who have actually gone into um, a global health field might be a better, better place to answer this question. Yeah, Ruba, uh, with HIV work. Anyway, okay. I'll take a pass, but okay. happy to come Parker. back. Thanks, Chris. I'm just going to, Ruba, before you start, yeah. um, tell me about when you um, when you start your conversation, if you studied a language and how maybe I'm just having that language insight, if that helped at all. And if you didn't, would you do it differently? That type of thing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ruba. Okay. So I, <laughs> I studied a language, I studied Swahili. So I did uh, the CLS program, um, which is critical language uh, scholarship. So I was in Arusha, Tanzania for two months studying Swahili. And uh, it would have helped if I retained most of the stuff I studied because Tanzania is currently one of my, uh, my countries in my portfolio. I definitely, I would recommend if you are, going into the field of anything global to pick up a language and the language that I would recommend is French actually. Um, that's the one thing that I wish I picked up um, or I wish I continued with. 
or even if you do like if you there is an area of the world that you kind of have like this is where I want to study this is where I want to work like if I um, I knew that I wanted to work in East Africa so that's why I picked up Swahili I just um, I never really continued with it after I think after I graduated um, I would definitely recommend either French or like that regional country um, so even if you are working in Africa I mean you know, you could be placed anywhere and a lot of the countries in West Africa, they're francophone. So it's just, it's a lot easier when you have that, um, when you have that scale. Like I, DRC is one of my other countries. Actually, most of my portfolio are francophone countries. And, um, you know, DRC, sometimes we're sitting in meetings and sometimes they're speaking in French and they're like, I don't understand. Um, so I would definitely recommend um, a language. The To answer the question that was put in the chat, I think global health is just such a broad field that I don't think you have to, uh, and this is also depending on where you want, where you want to go, right? But I, I don't think that you have to start off with a degree in global health because there are a lot of other skills that are needed, um, a lot of hard skills that are needed that don't necessarily fall under global health, but are very much like, it's such a it's such a collaborative field that you know if you studied um, coding you can work in, in in global health right like we have like in my team we have like a coder who helps us with the tracking system you know there's so many people with so many different backgrounds whether you want a technical background that makes more sense for you to go and study um, you know if you wanted to do infectious diseases that makes sense but um, my project is considered global health but it's also supply chain. Um, so it's very interdisciplinary. And I think if you have a skill, there is a place for you in global health. If you are more of like a generalist, um, also depending on what that general, what you're generally like, you know, known for. But I, I, I don't think that you really have to start off with like, okay, I'm going to get a degree and then, um, and then I want to do global health. I actually would recommend working global health first and then see what you like and what you want to specify in um one of my other recommendations again is like to really have a skill um because it's very it's a very broad field and i think you can easily get lost in it i think when you have a skill you can um and a lot of these skills you can pick up without a degree you know it's a lot of stuff that they don't really teach you i think a lot of the skills um whether it's uh you know, you're doing like data analysis or, or M&E or et cetera, you can, you can pick up um, what type of skills. Yeah, so uh, data analysis, M&E, uh, program management, which is, which is essentially what I do. Um, and, you know, there are certificates for that as well. Um, and then there are specifics like supply chain, um, which, I mean, you can get a certificate in that, you can get a master's in that. Um, there's yeah there's just it's a lot it's a lot of different parts and I, I would recommend that you look do research and kind of um look at how all these different inter interdisciplinary teams work together and figure out like where do you think I would fit best in, in this team I can pass it to somebody else who might have a, a better or different answer I can um talk about my my experience so and this is coming from someone who did two master's degrees in global health, and I don't think you, you know, need it um, to, to work in global health. I specifically did that um, in part because I'm going through the nursing program at, uh, at Pitt. I also felt like there's so much in the U.S., particularly in the healthcare system, that needs to change. So one of the reasons why I studied global health is to see how things are done um, in other places to 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 bring it back here. I mean, for example, um, when I talk about studying in Rwanda, a lot of people say like, oh, well, what did you like do there? What did you implement? And I didn't implement anything there. Like I studied there. And so I studied to and saw how robust like the community health system is there and try to take some of those lessons um, to my current work where in California, I do think 
public health is more funded um, than than I've seen in other places. But at the same time, there are a lot of structural structural challenges. Um, I do think having um, both hard skills and soft skills is is beneficial for me. Um, I do seem to get trust um, in different places because I'm I'm a nurse. Um, and so there there is something to be said about having, you know, a specific skill set or a specific type of experience. And I would also say that soft skills as well go a lot. Like you can send your resume. Um, but what Neha was saying about relationship building, I think is absolutely critical. Like no one wants to work with someone who just shows up and is like, I know the answer, or like, I, you know, let me tell you what to do because I'm from the US, you know, like that's not um, a great way to interact. So um, I would say really trying to engage as much as possible with um, like collaboration and also just taking like a deep breath um, is something I really learned as well in Rwanda. Um, I think we're so busy, you know, we have, there's so much to do and, and so many things like that, but in a lot of places, like just jumping in and saying like, let's work on this project isn't how people might might want to work together. So I think really trying to build those relationships is um, is essential for, for this type of work. Add on to that question. If, if not, um, Crystal said, I'm interested in what specific challenges each of you face day to day in your careers. How do you address these challenges and what do these challenges teach you about the field? Megan, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so I think uh, this actually flows nicely off of what Elaine was just saying around um, soft skills and working with folks. I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to align what sort of we think is a priority or what we even have time for with what others think is important or what they have time for. Often our country office staff are really busy um, and they really have to prioritize heavily what they're doing. And there's quite a few things are running. So I work in HIV specifically, but they also, there are quite a few other global health programs alone that they're having to juggle. So malaria, um, there's also respiratory viruses that work overseas, lots of different global health programs. So just really um, trying to find ways to balance what we think is important on our end and headquarters with what is important on the ground. And also, uh, understanding that we don't have that insight. Uh, we try as much as we can from afar, like in Atlanta. Um, Neha mentioned um, travel she has coming up. So we do try to go in country uh, and work with staff one-on-one -on -one and go into the field and see what's actually going on. But even then we just don't have the same kind of understanding of, of what the actual on the ground is in, on the day-to-day -day as they do. Um, so really striking that balance is critical um, there's a lot of, um, I'll call it diplomacy, um, sort of in a, in a more loose sense of what diplomacy is, because uh, there can be technical diplomacy as well. Uh, but really with working with both the CDC staff uh, that we have, or our federal staff or our partner staff, um, implementing the same programs, as well as with the ministries of health and country offices. Uh, and then there's also things like technical resources. So we have a uh, access to far more resources, often even to stable networks. Um, so things uh, like computer programming like SAS or R that people might learn to use to do data analysis is just not going to be as accessible to everyone that we work with. Um, so you'll often do work in things like Excel. So something that you might think, oh, I'm not going to do much work in that. I've got a more advanced degree. We're doing complicated things. You actually do it's important to sort of flex to what is reasonable with the people that you're working with and what they have access to, to make something that's usable. You, if no one can use it, then there's no point in making it. Um, but yeah, so those are just a couple of the challenges I think that come up. Um, uh, but yeah, so I can pass it to somebody else who might have some other ideas as well.
I can chime in a little bit too. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think the most challenging, well, to um, balancing relationships, um, especially when you're walking ac- working across different cultures, is something that you really have to learn how to do. The like, cultural sensitivity is such an important soft skill that you need to have. Um, and a lot of that comes with also just, you know, um, a lot of introspective work, but also a lot of exposure. Um, and also just like what was mentioned before, just being very like diplomatic and just very, you know, I, one of the hardest things that I had to face when I first started off was like, how do I send in like an email? You know, I had to make sure that before I send an email to USAID, I needed to send it to one of my supervisors to look through just to make sure that, um, you know, everything was correct. So communication and, and cultural sensitivity is it's it's very important especially when you're working across different teams um and the second is uh just even though sometimes you you know it's, it's a lot help more helpful to specify and have a skill in a certain um area <clears throat> going back to what i was saying earlier global health is very general so if you do end up going that generalist route be prepared to know a little bit of everything um and if you don't know you'll have to figure it out um, you can figure it out along the way. You can figure it out on the side. But like a lot of the work that I do is um, a lot of Excel spreadsheets, you know, PowerPoints. A lot of the stuff that we did in college is like um, is transferring itself here on, on the on the real job. Um, writing emails, um, you know, mm-hmm. being able to to budget and um, do a lot of things that have to do with like you know accounting and finance, et cetera. Um, even though we have departments for all of those, you do have to like at least have an understanding of how each part works and how each of the part, like the contribution to the to the full picture at the end of the day. Um, I see that two of you, uh, or I know that two of you received your degrees overseas and, and that Chris, you're actually teaching at Sciences Po. And I know there's a master's program, um, that, um, some of our students have been interested in. Can you tell the difference, you know, ter- kind of a comparison of getting, a or, or what you think, that opportunity of studying a master's program abroad um, offers you compared to going domestically? Sure, Eileen. Um, well, I think it's really more about the experience. The um, I don't know if it was Ruba or somebody else who um, was talking about learning or maybe it was Evelyn, but learning how other people do things abroad to see how they apply back home. So, and there's opportunities where we can take skills learned in the U.S. and apply them, particularly in developing countries. But um, yeah, I, I think when I was an undergrad, I chose to do a semester abroad, and I went to France for a semester. It changed my life. Definitely is what impacted my career choices in studying uh, at Pitt. So, and it's the same thing with the languages. Aruba was studying, uh, mentioning wanting to study French. I mean, that's uh, the more languages you know, it opens lots of doors, lots of windows, general understanding of, of different cultures. It's hard. Doing it on your own is really hard. I mean, I got lucky. I got paid to study languages and studied five. Um but at least one, pick up one at a place that you'd like to go and uh, and travel, and yeah, it's it's enriching. Um, on the earlier question about challenges, I mean, uh, like I said, I'm a little different from from the rest of the groups. I'm not doing technical work around health and um, or healthcare rather, but am focused on policy and politics that address our food systems, and we know that global food systems have now become the number one killer, in fact, of of, uh, large 
numbers of the population because of poor diets and the non-communicable diseases that accompany them, cancers and heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. That's a massive thing. Um, and it is the biggest challenge you asked about is trying to convince countries, communities, even individuals to change the way they eat. Um, there's a, a push with the White House now that is a um, policy push called Food is Medicine. And this is coming from a, a lot of work out of Tufts and a number of schools in the nutrition fields that are trying to battle the, the industrialization of food, the massive marketing to children of uh, foods that are high in sugar, fats, and salts. Um, and it's, it's something that we all have to think about, no matter whether you're going into HIV work or you know, what specific field, we all eat and we all have to deal with the health consequences of eating or diets. So that's the challenge that sort of goes through all the work I do, teaching, consulting, uh, even with the U.S. government and the Foreign Service. So, yeah, that's something that um, I think can be those those who are interested in that field. There's so much you can do, right from your own you know shopping basket to your kitchen table and kitchen to how to help communities address you know, food deserts or poor nutrition. Um, uh, you know, programs that deal with with nutrition. So I could go on for a long time on this field, but uh, just to say, yeah, definitely language, definitely travel, definitely think about uh, the politics of food and food is medicine. Over. Um, Evelyn and Robot, would you, kind of the highlights of, of um, studying a getting your master's abroad and would you do it again or have you seen some positives to that or would you say uh, maybe the network I would have made uh, at John Hopkins might even be better I don't know kind of throw these things up I can um, I can say I would a thousand percent do it again I actually um my family thinks I'm a bit uh, off the deep end, but I'm thinking after like my my current um, PhD program, if I could do a, a postdoc or something abroad, um, I would love to. I think for me, um, not only was it beneficial for like my academics or or professional skills, or um, I mean, one challenge is if you are then applying to like higher education in the U.S., you need to go through different levels of like getting it certified that you completed a program abroad. Um, but that's not a big, you know, a, that's the biggest issue I've faced is like needing to pay to to get someone to certify that my degree counts in the U.S. Um, but it was... I learned like completely new contexts or, and just thought a lot more critically about how and why I'm doing what I'm doing here and why systems are set up ways here. Um, and also just personally, like it really, I, some of my best friends like live abroad. I'm going to visit them, um, at the end of the summer. And so I think, um, yeah like academic or um I mean I say academically because that's kind of the field I'm I'm working in but um professionally and personally um I would a thousand percent do it again I would also do it again I think I had a few reasons to study abroad um one it was just uh it was shorter and it is cheaper my program at least was um than studying in the United States also the program that I wanted to do at the school that I wanted to do um, there was really not much of a difference I would say if I had studied it here as opposed to um, in London just because of they're both you know they're recognized um, and the school that I went to is also recognized in the field of global health and international uh, development I definitely I think uh, the connections that you make your you're you're in a space where you can make more connections, I think, with just different people because my school is also extremely international. So um, I think 
over 50%, maybe even over 60% of the population is actually from outside of the UK. And um, because of that opportunity, I was able to meet so many different people from all different backgrounds and also make those connections as well. Um, I actually wanted to plug in, so Sion's Po and LSE actually have a dual degree, if anybody's interested in doing that. Um, the dual degree, I had a few friends who had done their first year at Sion's Po and then came to LSE. Um, they have their dual degree, and double degree in international affairs, and then one in political economy and development, if anyone is interested in doing that. But I... Um, I would highly recommend it. I think it's just nice, especially if you are working in a field that is global. Um, if you don't get a chance to work globally beforehand, then there's always the the chance to study um, globally, whether it's to get a degree or to get language. There are so many different programs that the government offers and that, that are just out there. I didn't even know that getting my master's abroad would be like as easy as it was or just like as an option until I actually had one of uh, my professors at Pitt who told me that her daughter was getting her degree in, in the UK as well. So that's when I have the time to kind of look around and see and look at different um, different programs. So I would I would highly I would highly recommend it. Yeah. So um, we are kind of going to be coming to an end here, but if we could just go around and say if you could um give like one word of advice or one sentence of advice for students who are considering careers in global health what would it be if, if they're currently let's say they're current pit students what would be your one pitch to them uh we'll start with i'm going to go across my screen evelyn I was just going to say apply, like just as we're both saying, there's so many different programs and opportunities. It's frustrating. Like I spent, I completed so many applications. Um, and so, but I would just say, you know, even a quick Google search, like you can just start applying for things. And I think things will work out um, as they do. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, I think I would repeat something similar, which is, yeah, apply, um, experiment, and uh, be open to to adventure. I think, um, yeah, the the things that worked for me best were definitely not what I had planned or expected. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think um, reach out, talk to people, be open to new ideas. And um, yeah, there's a million different things you can do in the field. Everything from you know, more technical research data analysis to diplomacy. Um, you know, CDC, I had friends who worked for CDC at the U.S. Embassy in Rome, for example. I mean, they they post specialists abroad to do public policy. So it's not, um, you don't, you have opportunities throughout your career to do things like travel, work abroad. Um, it's easier to learn a language when you're between 20 and 25, uh, I can tell you that. So, you know, take those opportunities now, experiment and uh, and enjoy. Reba? I have a few that I'm gonna try to condense into a very, very long sentence. Um, so the number one is I think, uh, do your research on global health. Do your research on what jobs are there. Is Even if you go on LinkedIn and just type in global health jobs, Look at the job titles, look at the job descriptions. What do these people do? They'll give you an idea of what your day to day might look like or also what skills might be needed. Uh, number two, if you're a generalist, try to understand a little bit of everything. If you want to specify in something, get a skill and stick to it. Um, a lot of global health um, organizations hire um, technical consultants. Um, and those are those are very useful, um, and those are needed in almost every organization. Um, number three, if you can, pick up a language, um, and be consistent and stick to that language. Um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard, especially if you're not immersed in it. Which goes into number four, if you can get immersed in that language. Um, so there are a lot of programs that 
like the program that I did CLS where, you know, they'll literally pay for you and pay you to go to a different country and study that language. Um, so immersion is, is key. Number five, um, don't limit yourself in, in, in terms of if there's something that you're thinking, okay, like I'm interested in doing this, nine times out of 10, search it up and it's there. Like there's an opportunity for it. There's somebody who's going to fund it for you. Um, and these are also a lot of things that I wish I somebody would have told me or told myself when I was um, in my early 20s. Um, so definitely, you know, whatever you can think of, whatever you want is definitely out there. You just have to like look for it. And then number six is be confident in yourself. Um, you're going to go in and you're going to be like, oh, my God, these people know so much. And then you, can, you begin to work with a lot of people and you realize that you might be on the same level. Um, and you know, everybody is learning. And this is something that even like I'm learning at my job now, you know, working in this field is lifelong learning. Um, you're never going to be at a point where like I've arrived and I know everything because you're working with a lot of issues that also evolve as you are evolving too. Um, so you have to be able to, uh, um, you know, just, uh, be loose and, you know, like evolve with, with everything around you. Um, and then I would say the last one is just uh, go out of your comfort zone. Um, definitely go out of your comfort zone and, and and step out of the box and just like don't think that because this is something that has always been done this way, I have to stick to it. Um, you know, because global health is such a it's such a large field and there's so many different aspects that go into it you don't have to always follow a specific mold or, or follow somebody else's specific footsteps. Um, you know, you might have a certain interest and you're like, okay, well, I don't think I'm going to find in global health. You probably will find something, um, something there. So I think those are what the six or seven that I would say um, things that I, I, I think everybody should kind of uh, follow or at least keep in the back of their mind when they are approaching working in global health. Neha, you're going to have to add something onto that list <laughs> if you can. I know I feel like that everyone has said great things. So maybe just reiterating to like be trust yourself and be confident. There's so much space in global health. And if there's something that you want to do, you're going to you're going to find as long as you want it, you're going to find a way. And I think like Chris said as well, um, like be prepared for the unexpected. And if you see a cool opportunity and it wasn't on your original plan, just just take it. Like you never, you really never know. And that's part of the fun of working in this field. Um, and that everyone in global health is very cool. It takes a certain type of person to really enjoy this lifestyle. So don't hesitate to reach out to colleagues or other people. Uh, and my last one is you're going to use Excel a lot more than you think you are. So I would say learn uh, as much as you can about Excel. Thank you, Neha. Megan? Yeah, um, so every, what everyone said is really fantastic. <laughs> um, and I think really importantly, uh, if you're interested in something, there are tons of fellowships out there and they're really great ways to get into global health um, and to get that bit of global experience really early in your career is super critical. Um, and then something that I don't think anyone has mentioned yet, but that I know a lot of my colleagues have done is Peace Corps. That's another great program um, that people can join to get tons of different kinds of experience across all of the global spectrum. It certainly isn't just health. Um, there's lots of infrastructure work, yeah, nutrition, uh, education. So lots of different kinds of experience. If you're whatever you're interested in, Peace Corps can help with and give some of that um, real experience and also immersion in a language as well. Um, so that's another thing. But yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. I, I appreciate all your insight. Chris, Megan, Neha, Ruba, Evelyn. Um, uh, thank you, Crystal, for organizing this. Uh, I wish you all the best in what you're doing. You're all doing very important, profound work. And uh, uh, keep in touch. Tomorrow's Pitt's Day of Giving. <laughs> You're going to be getting an email from me. You already have. It's so embarrassing. But to five dollars, um, it helps for all that you guys have done. It helps for our student programming here at Pitt. So we appreciate it. Um, uh, have a great day. And uh, thank you for your time.